I abandoned Cyberpunk 2077 almost two years ago during one of the first missions with Pan Am, who I'm told is a fan favorite. Late one night, I shut off the game, having no idea that things were about to play out in a way where I wouldn't touch it again for years. At the time, I wasn't planning to quit Cyberpunk, but then, my sister died. Believe it or not, and this may shock you, that threw my life off track a bit, and ultimately, I really never felt the desire to return to Night City, until recently. The truth is, my original experience with Cyberpunk was miserable on the PS4 I had at launch. By the time I quit quit, I had already taken multiple breaks, waiting and waiting for what I hoped would evolve into a better, less broken experience. Flash forward to 2023, and I've now given Cyberpunk another chance in its current state, putting in over 100 additional hours on PC for two main reasons. One, to see if the game could win me over, and two, far more important, so I could finally justify that cyberpunk artwork that's been in my banner looming over my channel since I started it a year and a half ago. Before I say anything else, I do think it's worth pointing out that much has been made recently of cyberpunk's redemption, a narrative I feel is frequently exaggerated in both directions. If we're just talking about bugs and only bugs, then okay, fair enough, although as I'll get to, it's really not that simple. Regardless, I want to stress that Cyberpunk isn't a game that started out completely irredeemable with no merit, and then suddenly blossomed into a masterpiece after a handful of updates. That's the way the game is often lazily portrayed, especially here on YouTube. Broadly speaking, what's great about Cyberpunk beyond the bugs was always great, and what was mediocre or outright bad is simply less so now. The game still has several problems baked into its core that won't ever be fixed, unless you consider the release of a sequel that writes past wrongs a fix. On the other hand, Night City is positively overflowing with characters you'll never forget, quests that contain moments sure to resonate with you long after the credits have rolled, and maybe most important of all for those who care to pay attention, Cyberpunk is filled to the brim with detailed world building that brings most other games to their knees. The game's issues and strengths are at constant war with one another, and in my playthrough at least, that led to frequent whiplash in my level of enjoyment from quest to quest. Those problems begin with the main story and splinter out from there. When I resumed my original playthrough, I was under the impression that I had only just begun. I thought maybe at most I was a third of the way into the main quest as I remembered every single story beat, and it felt like it was just the beginning. Of course, I quickly realized I was very wrong, embarrassingly wrong and that I was but a few hours away from the point of no return, which I almost couldn't believe when it came up. What that led to was a brick wall of story progression, and Hanako waiting at Embers for about four in-game months straight, while I went around and spent 50-odd hours doing all the side content I hadn't already taken care of. Without that investment of time into Pan Am, Judy, Carrie, the Paralyses, and countless other side quests that fleshed out the relationship between Johnny and V, the ending would have fallen so flat for me, it would have had no impact, but with that side content, well, we'll get to that. First though, let me say that Cyberpunk has pacing issues. In fact, saying it that way is a near criminal understatement. It's not just a single issue either, the obvious one has probably been discussed enough at this point, but I'll touch on it. V has a biochip in his skull, one that contains a construct of Johnny Silverhand. This biochip sees V's brain cells as invasive, a parasite to be expelled. And apparently, within a matter of three weeks tops, V will be gone and Johnny will take over, although Silverhand isn't at fault for that. It's the biochips doing. This news is broken to V by the Ripper Doc Vic, and from that point forward, V has a very time-sensitive goal. Get Silverhand out of his head before it's too late, and you've got a few weeks at most. Now you might say maybe Vic is wrong with his estimate, but that doesn't matter. V is operating from the perspective that he has just a few weeks, could be less, to find a solution or die. It's weird then that the entire structure of Cyberpunk is actively battling against you blasting through the main quest in search of a solution. The side quests you complete give you unique options for how you choose to round out V's story, and also affect plenty of details in your epilogue. Not only that, this isn't a game where you get to continue on doing side content in a post-ending world. No, you're put back into Night City before the ending. In fact, you can just go on and complete other endings if you want, so even if you save the less essential side content for later, you'll still be doing it as a V who should be on Death's Door, which for the most part the game conveniently forgets about outside of the most important side stories. Like I said, I spent months of in-game time side questing right before the end game, which made no sense narratively, and there isn't a place in the story to naturally fit everything in considering V's situation. 
maybe a quick gig here or there for some money and a few tasks for important people in V's life, but much more than that and it gets really awkward if you think about it at all. The game puts the responsibility of getting over that on the player's shoulders. Either you ignore it or it'll bother you your entire playthrough. And in my case, I just eventually accepted the awkwardness for the sake of my own enjoyment. What I wasn't ever really able to accept though was the game's poor handling of time in other ways, especially the small, easily fixable things that really pulled me out of the experience when they cropped up. For example, let's briefly discuss the Judy Quest line, which, don't get me wrong, I loved. It was perfect. Perfect. Everything. Down to the last minute details. My favorite element of this quest line was the male v Judy friendship. I feel like strong platonic male female friendships are pretty rare in games, especially ones that get a fair amount of time devoted to them. Maybe it's just what I've been playing lately, I don't know, but I found it really refreshing, much like the sibling relationship in A Plague Tale. Just a positive dynamic you don't see as often as maybe you should. The reason I bring Judy's story up on the topic of time though, is because of what happened almost immediately after her quest line wrapped up. At the end, spoilers, obviously, she tells you she plans to leave Night City. A little bittersweet, but absolutely the right decision for her. Well, that night, not even 24 hours later in-game, V gets a text from Judy, and what does it say but that she's somehow in Oregon, and not only that, she's been there for days. I'm thinking, Judy, if we were such close friends that you gave me your apartment, you could have told me you were a time traveler. In fact, that likely would have come in really handy considering my dire life or death situation that I chose to confide in you. Maybe you could have popped back in time a few weeks and given Dex a lead injection before he had the chance to do the same to me. If this were just a one-off time-related immersion-breaking moment, I wouldn't have mentioned it, but V's phone in particular caused a ton of awkwardness. During one of the fist fights, you can goad your opponent, his name is Buck, into offering up his sniper rifle. If you beat him, he throws a hissy fit, which is code for tries to murder you with his buddies. Not even five seconds after I'd wiped them out, I get a text from the fighting coach, saying he'd heard earlier that things got really messy across town, and that he'd always known Buck was a bad egg. How did he hear about that and have the time to text me in the nine milliseconds since it happened? I get it's the future, but in those moments it just feels like the characters don't actually exist in this world outside of waiting around to contact you. Another example, one of the gigs for Regina Jones has you rescuing a man named Hal and escorting him outside the building. As I'm doing that, Regina calls V and says, hey, Hal is very happy and talks about you all the time. Oh, does he? Because it was about four seconds ago that I broke him out of a shipping container, and he's still right in front of me on the phone with someone else. It's not an attempt at a joke, Regina wasn't in a silly, goofy mood, it's just a nonsensical moment, which are pretty common with the fixers. I have plenty of non-phone examples too. There's this side job called Stadium Love, where you come across a rooftop group of god fear and NUSA patriots, and you can participate in their little marksmanship contest. After I'd done that, the captain puts on a not at all convincing tough guy act and says, hey, we had fun today, but that won't change anything if we later cross paths as enemies. I'm thinking, okay, this clown will probably come up again later. For now though, what next? So I pull up my minimap and see there's an active crime extremely close by and beeline my way there. Who is committing the crime but the same guy from the rooftop? The crime was already taking place and he was still there when I left, yet here he is somehow despite me going straight there. Those moments really pulled me out of the game, that's just a select few of them by the way, and each could have been streamlined so easily that it's strange to me they weren't. Aside from the messy handling of time though, the side content is often really something, especially the actual side quests, not the gigs, at least not yet. I'm well aware that the Pan Am storyline is a fan favorite, and it's not hard to understand why. Pan Am is among the most realized characters in Cyberpunk, and equally important, many of her companions are given a lot of time as well, which makes her feel like a real part of this world and not V's personal information dispensary. By the end of the game, I not only cared about Pan Am, but also Mitch and Sam Elliott and even Saul despite his flaws. The Paralysis storyline was another perfectly executed side story, and the ending was a masterclass in atmosphere. That scene in the diner with Elizabeth, I felt so uneasy. There were no specific tells, but I just knew V was being watched, and the wrap-up with Jefferson replicated that feeling perfectly. I had no idea what was about to happen, and the tension was so high that nothing happening was just as nerve-wracking as any other possible outcome. My favorite quest line, though, was everything with Johnny's band Samurai, and the string of Carrie's quests that splintered out from it. 
Exploring Carrie's house tells you half of what you need to know about him before you've spoken a word to the guy. He has 50-some successful years as a solo artist under his belt, yet what does he want to be constantly reminded of in his home? The Samurai Days. He also obsessively reads reviews on his own albums, and his entire house is almost impressively tacky for how expensive everything clearly is. As you get to know Carrie, it becomes obvious that he's very insecure in his legacy and the path he took in life. Whereas Johnny lived fast and died young and everyone remembers him as he was for better or worse, Carrie lived on, sold out, and went corporate and commercial. He's rich, yeah, but fake. He stopped making music for himself and started writing songs for his label. You just know old school samurai fans in Night City chat online about how all of Carrie's new stuff sucks, and only the old samurai was ever any good. Carrie's pathetic midlife crisis endeavor to sabotage the pop trio Us Cracks who planned to cover one of his songs was so entertaining. It just gets progressively more and more embarrassing, but I felt compelled to stick with it just to see how things played out. He whines about how the group are just industry plants and make music to chase trends, yet much of that is just his own insecurity. Read anything about Carrie in-game or just pay attention to his words, and it's clear his solo career has been anything but authentic. When you get the chance to unite Carrie and the Us Cracks against their managers, it's oddly wholesome even if Carrie isn't quite taking away all the lessons he should. He's still being a weird gatekeeper, but he's moving in the right direction. Carrie and the Us Cracks together reminded me a lot of Rob Halford playing with Baby Metal. Maybe that was the inspiration. Anyway, during the last Carrie quest, he finally reconnects with his true self a bit, musically at least. Even the quest that takes off from the ending of the Carrie quest line is really solid. You have to hunt down a stalker of one of the Us Cracks members. It was pretty tense for me because I wasn't sure I had the right person, but I was 90% there. Carrie's and the other samurai quests did a lot of heavy lifting in connecting both myself and V with Johnny. I let him have his wild night out, I got the band back together, and even gave him his chance for a drive-in movie night. Movie was a turd wrapped in crepe paper. What I loved about Cyberpunk were mostly the character moments. Flipping Johnny off in what might be the game's most unexpectedly wholesome interaction. Pan Am toasting Jackie after you opened up to her a little. Takemura accidentally sending you all of his browser searches for food in Night City. Hell, even the guy who fried his family jewels off has a strangely heartwarming goodbye. Just, uh, check the warranty next time. <laughs> Will do. Take care, man. In a vacuum, ignoring the, for me, immersion-breaking time issues, most of the side quests are good to excellent. The main exceptions had to do with fist fighting and racing. Those quests are very impressive. Impressive in that CDPR somehow managed to make both types worse than their Witcher 3 equivalents which really is an awe-inspiring accomplishment. The racing with Claire is just awful. The AI slows down to a crawl if you fall behind, and if you get too far ahead, the other cars will despawn and teleport behind you. You'll frequently hear them blowing up in the distance as they often spawn inside of other vehicles. The other racer's actions are directly tied to how you're doing, and the worst part is that the game doesn't even do a half-decent job of disguising it. As for the fistfights, well, there's nothing to them. They're a button-spam-filled waste of time that I only dealt with for the slivers of story. Open-world games have this irritating habit of feeling the need to shove in a checkbox of expected quest types without actually putting any effort into the mechanics. If you're not going to put together semi-competent racing, don't have races. If you're set on having a string of fistfighting quests, either give us more than the bare minimum or don't bother and invest that time elsewhere. What do you think? I think it's time we moved on. Cyberpunk also has many of these small-time side jobs, which are marked on your map as being the type to not make major headlines. Minor events to build your rep or make a few eddies, that sort of thing. A lot of these are progression locked and don't appear until you finish certain missions or visited and then return to specific areas. These were consistently solid, but I strongly suspect that some, or even most of the quests that fall into this category were not originally meant to be marked and that having them as yet another icon for you to clear off your world map robs these of some of the memorability and impact they could have had. One of the best examples takes place in a luxury clothing shop in downtown Night City. A quest marker will appear there as a side job after visiting the shop for the first time. Once you show up to the marker, you'll talk to the manager, and after you've looked at the store inventory, an event will trigger where a cyber psycho attacks the store. You take him out and MaxTac, a special NCPD unit, will show up and question you. It's actually a pretty interesting little event, there's a nice Johnny moment, and there's also this semi-awkward one-sided romantic tension going on, between the Max Tac officer, who you later find out was a cyber-psycho herself, and V. If you're looking for a psycho soulmate, 
It ain't me, babe. While I did enjoy this very short quest, I couldn't help but think of how surprising and memorable the attack on this store would have been had I not known something was about to happen. If I just walked into the store, say for the first time, to check their inventory, and suddenly this event triggered, I mean wow, that would have caught me way off guard. It's also that exact type of event that make open worlds feel alive, and not like a setting that holds your hand between near empty stretches of map as you travel from marked event to marked event. This was something Witcher 3 did so well. Doing a very rough count, I could think of well over 50 completely unmarked side quests that could only be stumbled upon by exploring the world on your own. They made the continent feel so lived in, and while each one wasn't necessarily remarkable as a standalone quest, they did a lot to make exploration beyond the question marks feel rewarding. Is it 1358 yet? No. Then fuck off. Cyberpunk has shockingly few of these, less than five. In fact, I think the actual number is two, although I'll just stick with less than five to cover myself. And obviously, I'm not talking about the scanner hustles. On that note though, why don't we shift over to the gigs and then the scanner hustles? I've often seen the gigs referred to as nothing but mindless filler, and as a blanket statement, that's a ridiculous thing to say. The best gigs are among the strongest content Cyberpunk has to offer, and it's not five great gigs among the near 100 in total, of which I did every single one. No, I'd say about a third are very strong, and beyond that, well, for now I'll just say they range in quality. The best gig, or my favorite I suppose, was Family Matters. One of your fixers has an important person go missing and wants you to investigate. As you search their home, you quickly piece together that the missing person, Julia, had a cyber-psychotic sister she was doing her best to help, but the evidence keeps mounting that something went very wrong, to the point where even Johnny gets uneasy. You even find out when snooping through emails that Julia had reached out to the Ripper Doc Vic for help, and that he'd advised her to contact MaxTac before she ended up dead, which makes the conclusion to this gig all the more tragic. When you go down to the basement, you discover that the mentally afflicted sister had killed the other, and you're tasked with subduing the cyber psycho. My only hang up with this gig was that I went way out of my way to spare the living sister, because I'm sure that's what the other would have wanted. Plus, the game is constantly beating you over the head with a moral obligation to spare cyber psychos, as rehabilitation is possible to an extent. But unfortunately, the game never acknowledged me sparing her, and actually acted like she was dead. Bummer. The other gigs I thought were pretty consistently great all had optional objectives. Get in and out without being spotted, avoid any bloodshed, manage to take the target alive, you get it. It wasn't necessarily the optional objectives themselves that made that type better, I just found that those gigs often had significantly more effort put into them than the others. They usually had several NPCs to talk to, multiple unique ways to go about completing the optional task, plus there was always extra pay for doing the gig exactly as instructed. Seeing that a gig had an optional objective was often an indication that it would be at least above average. The other gigs were a mixed bag, and did get pretty repetitive. I'll give them credit where it's due. Without exception, or very close, gigs could be approached however you wanted. There were almost always several entry points, and gameplay-wise, each accommodated just about any playstyle you could think of. Each gig also had at least one, but usually three to four data shards or emails that would add context and frequently made connections between other gigs. I read all of them because I can't help myself, it's a disease, and there was a real effort to make little connections between the gangs of Night City. Names from previous gigs would pop up often, and that effort in the text-based lore was appreciated. That said, the weaker gigs did wear out their welcome for me. About half of them really are just go here, shoot X or steal Y, and that's really all there is to it. Yes, even with the simplest gigs there was always context to be found about why you're shooting X or stealing Y or hacking Z, but I'm of the opinion that gigs, in general, just relied way too heavily on shards and emails in presenting information to the player. The shards in particular rarely felt like natural environmental storytelling. They were there to present information to you in real life, not because they had any sensible reason to be where they were in-game. Just in the interest of making things more varied, some voice logs or more frequent use of NPC conversations to overhear would have went a long way. As it stands, many of the gigs lacked creativity in presenting the solid world building that usually was there. How you were going to get that information was very routine. It's also worth mentioning that tons of gigs have no dialogue whatsoever outside of the initial and wrap-up call from fixers, which 90% of the time have nothing to them. Occasionally, they'll be mildly interesting, but most boil down to, Hey V, got a guy I need you to shoot, sending a text with more details, and then, Hey V, thanks for shooting that guy, payment on the way. 
It makes sense, they're fixers, not my buddies necessarily, but it doesn't make those calls any less repetitive. And I must say, I hate the fixer call system in general. If I could change just one thing about Cyberpunk, it would be this system. How gigs are presented to you causes a full reset on immersion every time you start one. You'll get 10 feet away from where a gig takes place, and instantly your phone will ring to tell you about the gig you didn't know anything of before, but happen to be 10 feet away from right as they call you. They're calling because you, the player, know to go to that location from an icon on the world map, but in-game there's no reason for V to be there. And the fixers aren't calling because they tracked your location, or just sit around watching where you are at all times, that's never implied and would be dumb to begin with, the reality is this system was the path of least resistance for CDPR to dump gig exposition on players without needing to consider what made sense from V's perspective. It's a massive step back from their approach to Witcher contracts half a decade earlier. With those, CDPR knocked Immersion out of the park and making almost every single contract make perfect sense in-universe, regardless of what the player did. For example, if you stumbled upon the site of a Witcher contract before you'd actually picked up the contract itself, Geralt would often have completely different lines because he didn't have the same context. If you continued to investigate and even went as far as to find and kill a monster from a contract you hadn't yet picked up, you'd get in-universe reasons to lead you to quest completion. Geralt would think aloud, huh, I wonder if anyone local had a contract out on this beast, maybe I could get some money out of it, and you'd then be directed to check nearby notice boards. You wouldn't be nonsensically led straight to the contract giver just so the quest could complete, because Geralt wouldn't know who put out the contract or if one even exists. If Witcher 3 had taken Cyberpunk's approach, you'd find a contracted monster while free roaming and a peasant would just so happen to run up to you before the fight and say, Master Witcher, see that monster standing 10 feet away? Well, it just so happens that I have a contract on its head, and I was waiting in this location just in case a Witcher happened to stroll by. I know it's 4am and that doesn't really make any sense, but that doesn't matter, don't think about it, I was waiting right here. Anyway, this monster decapitated my second cousin, it's very sad, here's a piece of parchment with tons of exposition, and if you're lucky, the monster will drop another piece of parchment after it dies with even more context. Then, after you'd killed the monster, the peasant would run back up and say, Master Witcher, thank you kindly for slaying the beast. Here's your payment, and since you got three crossbow headshots on that drowner, I've left a bonus reward at the inn at the crossroads. Take care now. And that would be the end of it, rinse and repeat every single time you found a contracted monster. Ignoring the framework from the fixers though, the actual content of the gigs ranged from truly excellent to nothing more than a half-decent excuse to spend more time in Night City, which can sometimes be enough if you're looking to squeeze every second out of an experience. That also applies to the NCPD scanner hustles. They exist only for quick spurts of combat and easy money. You show up, a few criminals are chatting, you take them out, and then you find a data shard with an archived conversation that says, We are criminals planning a crime, with a reply of, Yes indeed, we truly are criminals, and I will now lay out the exact plan for the crime in this text message, so the mercenary that kills us later can pick it up. There's very little variation to these, which is fine, I'm not expecting street-level gang members to be splitting the atom in a darkened alleyway. For what they are, the scanner hustles serve their purpose well enough. On the topic of something simply serving its purpose, how about the combat? Well, I'm gonna keep this section really short. Cyberpunk offers an impressive variety of ways to kill the same very basic AI over and over and over again. I'm not saying that to condemn Cyberpunk's combat, there is a lot to like. The guns feel weighty and satisfying for the most part, the setting lends itself very well to stealth, there is a strong variety of melee options, and quick hacking is both unique and beyond viable. The downside is that 99% of the time, you're fighting the rough equivalent of Private Match Call of Duty bots circa 2015. In active combat, enemies will immediately forget you exist if you enter any semi-important room. In stealth, you can bumble around, bump into things, and cross right into the enemy's line of sight even on higher difficulties. All that matters is you don't let that awareness meter fill up. To be fair to Cyberpunk, when you're aggressively rushing into a situation and clearing all enemies immediately, it's fine. The AI is just there and you can make your own fun, which I think is a decent way to describe Cyberpunk's combat in general. The game expects you to make your own fun. You can put a bunch of time and thought into a really satisfying Netrunner build for the purpose of roleplay, but even on very hard difficulty, it's going to be in service of fighting incredibly simple enemies that could have been taken out just as easily rushing in and firing until there was nothing left to waste bullets on. You also can go out of your way to stealth, which I often did, but you the player will need to actively put effort in to not break the immersion, because the enemies couldn't possibly be dumber. Throughout my cyberpunk experience, I found the combat to simply be serviceable. Nothing more, nothing less. 
I enjoyed experimenting with new guns, cyberware, and other upgrades, but the combat itself was rarely something I actively looked forward to. For the most part, it was just fine. Six out of ten. Let's talk about narratives in the gaming world. Not in the sense of stories being told in games, but instead the stories and conversations that surround games in the real world, specifically here on YouTube. For years, up until about 24 hours pre-Cyberpunk's release, we were in the Cyberpunk is going to be the game to end all games phase. I never personally bought into that, if I'm being honest, but on YouTube, that was it. Then the game came out and we entered a new era, where YouTubers were expected to make videos about how Cyberpunk had no redeeming qualities, and was actually the worst game ever created by mankind. I didn't have this channel back in 2020, but as a viewer, I think all of us were familiar with at least one or two channels who put out glowing early access reviews just a day or two before release mentioning none of the problems, only to completely backpedal 24 hours later and start pumping out daily cyberpunk rage bait. Anyway, recently, really since Edge Runners came out, we've entered the Redemption Era, which means if I weren't an idiot, I'd play into that with a title along the lines of Cyberpunk is finally the game CDPR promised, or Cyberpunk 2077, two years later, an underrated gem, or better yet, an underrated masterpiece. Unfortunately, because I am kind of an idiot, this isn't one of those videos. My timing is way off in the conversation, and I haven't planted a flag on that side of the fence. Instead, this has just been my experience with Cyberpunk in 2023 completely removed from any of that, and if this video is coming off totally unfollowable as I jump between positives and negatives, I apologize, especially because I'm about to rapid fire through several of the most common complaints from launch to reassess them now. Open world NPCs, the type that walk the streets and drive vehicles, are still as simple as they come. They react to nothing beyond the bare minimum and feel like the lifeless cardboard cutouts they are. Driving is still somewhat awkward, with mouse and keyboard at least. It's manageable, but many vehicles just don't handle the way they should. Occasionally, it felt like my car was possessed and disobeying my input, wiping out dozens of innocent pedestrians in the process. Thankfully, mass pedestrian homicide has no real punishment in the current version of Night City. That may sound like a bad thing for immersion, which it is, but overall, it's probably for the best. At launch, Night City police were omniscient beings who were capable of teleportation. They were absolutely unbearable. In current cyberpunk, police might as well not exist. Commit a crime and all you have to do is drive for about 10 seconds or just enter a building and they'll completely forget about the middle class family you just pancaked. I'm not kidding about the building part either, there were so many times I accidentally set the police on myself after pedestrians unfortunately found themselves between the rubber and the road and all I had to do was enter some place where a gig or anything of note was located and I no longer existed to the NCPD. It doesn't always work, but more often than not, it does. The police in current cyberpunk are not immersive or impressive, but they weren't at launch either, and at least this system isn't annoying. CDPR have promised major changes to the police system, and I believe some vehicle changes as well, so if you're watching from months in the future, I hope to see comments about how it's better. On the topic of better, how about the bugs? Well, cyberpunk is far from a broken game in 2023. It crashed on me just once, and in 100 plus hours on PC, I encountered only two bugs that forced a reload. It was an overall stable experience, and the bugs remaining are mostly the distracting and occasionally funny type, but honestly there were quite a few of them. Ride companions phased through vehicles, characters floated to the ceiling and walked through closed doors, my HUD disappeared and wouldn't come back three separate times. During one mission, the person I was supposed to be interrogating just started talking to me from the great beyond. I couldn't figure out where his voice was coming from until I realized I'd blown him up with a grenade during combat, and he was lodged in the stairs, somehow having a conversation with me. Buck, the fist-fighting opponent I mentioned earlier, had a similar issue, and I couldn't start the fist fight because of this. One time, I got in my car only to find Pan Am lodged in the dash. She must have been comfortable because we then had a lengthy conversation. She also had a habit of floating outside the Aldecado camp, sitting on absolutely nothing. During one gig, an important character was holding me up, but didn't actually have a gun in his hand. It's possible he's a finger gun enthusiast, but I doubt it. My car would often spawn inside of walls, and then fly out the side of the building completely totaled. Honestly, I can't even begin to count the amount of times my vehicle would pull up absolutely trashed, because it spawned inside of another object, or in the basement of a building in the Badlands, and that happened like half a dozen times. I couldn't get my vehicle to spawn anywhere else after a specific gig. My bike also liked to hover above the ground, and then float away to find a new life far from the shackles of Night City. Bug or foreshadowing, you decide. That one happened to me several times. 
Once, I went out of my way to take down a cyber psycho non-lethally because the game makes such a big deal out of sparing them, yet the rest of the quest acted like I killed her, and that's separate from the gig I mentioned earlier that had the same issue. Those are just some of the more memorable bugs. I also had semi-frequent T-posing, and mouths not moving, and floating characters, and you get it. The worst bug I experienced sadly had to do with Skippy, everyone's favorite talking pistol. He never worked for me. I picked him up in the alley, and his hologram wouldn't show up. I couldn't fire him either. That stuck around my entire playthrough. I tried everything, even upgrading him in the crafting menu, and I was totally unable to fix this. Despite everything, Cyberpunk isn't a mess anymore, those clips were picked out of 100 hours of gameplay. The minor visual bugs are fairly common, and the annoying type that detract from the experience in a meaningful way are mostly gone, and kind of up to your own luck. I could only find one other person online who had that problem with Skippy, and they didn't seem to find a solution either, so clearly I was very unlucky in that case, and apparently that Skippy quest is one of the best in the game, so I don't know. Despite everything I've said, and the many and often major issues Cyberpunk has dragging it down, I would still highly recommend it based on its best content. The clearest way for me to put this is that, of the last five open world games I've finished, Cyberpunk is far and away the one that will stick with me the longest, solely based on its strongest moments. I've grown very tired of the consistently decent open world titles, the ones that leave you with nothing in the long run, even if overall they were pretty consistently average. For all its flaws, Cyberpunk isn't that. There are about 40 hours worth of fantastic quests in Cyberpunk. After that, the content ranges from pretty good but forgettable, all the way down to content that's only passable because it's in Night City. And if you love the setting, that might be enough for you to be somewhat entertained in those weaker hours. If you're looking for a game with excellent stealth, great melee combat, good driving, competent AI, any enemy variety at all, and police that don't behave like they've been lobotomized, well, this isn't it. Where Cyberpunk does succeed, though, is with the characters, and more often than not, the writing, which is usually great where it matters most. So, that was my first attempt at a video like this. Please let me know what you thought, hopefully it wasn't a mess. If you enjoyed, consider leaving a like, as that really helps videos get out there because YouTube is dumb, and if you'd like to see more from me, feel free to subscribe and or follow me on Twitter. Also, thank you to the channel's patrons who make long videos like this a possibility. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one.